Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to all your friends about the best wine show anywhere. So a couple months ago, I was hanging out on the Facebook when I saw someone say how many months old they were. So that got me thinking, how many months old am I? At the time, I was 640 months old. I remember seeing a wine called 642 from Tuscany and thought it would be a cool reason to do a review. Now, in case you were wondering, I turned 642 months old on February 8th of this year, so a week before I released this video. It was supposed to be put out on the 8th, but I had a delay in releases, so that meant the previous episode came out on the 8th instead. Anyway, let's get into some background on this wine. First, let's talk about the name. As you can see from the label, it's not just 642, but it's a six next to a coordinate. Specifically, it's 42 degrees, 47 minutes, 52 seconds north. You also see two intersecting lines with the longitudinal coordinates of 10 degrees, 58 minutes, 52 seconds east. This must mean something, right? It does. The six refers to the six different varieties used in the wine. They are Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Petit Verdot, Syrah, Sangiovese, and Grenache. An interesting combination for sure. A bit of Bordeaux with some Rhone, a dash of Tuscany. The coordinates are where the vineyard lies. Well, the winery, resort, and the vineyard. I went to the importer's website, and while it does have some useful information, it's still pretty basic, which is fine for the average wine drinker. But you know me, I want all the specs. I want the why. And actually, the importer does have a different kind of spec sheet that's really more for retailers and distributors. Really boring things like UPCs, info about bottle sizes, case weights, etc. Things you and I won't care about, or maybe you, but it's still important to many people in the industry. This seems like a good time to mention that I've resurrected my merchandise line. I retired my 1337 wine line, but now I have my WWTV and hashtag Outstanding Line merchandise. The Outstanding Line is all about positivity and it's based upon my response of outstanding when asked how I'm doing. I have polos, t-shirts, and accessories on Zazzle. Those are really for the WWTV side. Check out this sweet logo t-shirt I'm showing you. The outstanding line is all t-shirts. So far, I only have a small number of variations of t-shirts for both lines with more to come. Link below in the description, so please check them out and maybe buy one or two. Okay, enough of that. What's the romantic story behind the wine? Well, I'm going to be lazy on this and just kind of copy the description for the importer's site while I swoop in from space to show you the property. Tenuta la Bariola is located in the Marema on the southern coast of Italy. The region has become the ideal location for growing Bordeaux varietals, used for producing the popular Super Tuscan wines, as these grapes prefer warm days and cool sea breezes at night. The winery itself is located very close to the seaside town of Grosseto on the Tyrrhenian Sea. The estate dates back to the Middle Ages. The Duke of Tuscany, who reigned during the mid to late 1800s, spent much of his time there, and the vineyard at the estate was named after him, Il Canapone, a colloquialism for curly head. He was an avid hunter, and thus there is an elk that is on the label. The property is lined with cypress trees, maintains a small herd of farm animals, including the famous Chianina cattle, one of the largest and oldest breeds in the world. 84 hectares of olive trees, a luxurious boutique resort hotel, and a professional 18-hole golf course, a small piece of paradise. This is all from the website. Okay, so that's the cool backstory. What else? Well, the actual property is a resort, like we've already mentioned, a really nice one from the looks of it. So the info I just read said the winery is close to the town of Grosseto, which is a 20-minute drive to the resort. So the winery is probably on the property. How I read everything, the wine is actually made on site. The thing is, I can't find an actual website for the winery itself. There's nothing wrong with that. If you remember, the Chateau de Brise wine I reviewed isn't made at the Chateau, but elsewhere. Matter of fact, I still have... Ta-da! Anyway, um, this wine 
is made, may be made on the property, but the actual company or person may be somebody else. Maybe even a well-known winemaker or not. I didn't get that information from the, from the importer. I didn't ask either. During all this research, I almost made a very fatal error though. Somehow, some way, when I entered the coordinates into not only Google Earth Pro, but also Apple and Google Maps, I kept getting the middle of the Tyrrhenian Sea. So I did contact the importer and also the resort about this. The importer was kind enough to correct me in a really good way. <laughs> I went back and entered the coordinates again, and what do you know? Yep, smack in the middle of, you guessed it, the actual property. So how I screwed that up, I really can't figure it out. So thank you, Tony, for saving me from making that error. Let's get into the stats on the wine first. The 2017 Tenuta La Badiola 642, 1495 is what I paid for it. Marema DOC is a blend of six grapes, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Petit Verdot, Syrah, Sangiovese, and Grenache. 14% ABV, it is organically farmed but not certified, which is totally cool. So let's check out the wine. I'm actually really excited to try this wine. I've been kind of seeing it recently and the name is intriguing, the, the label's intriguing, because you know what? We buy wine on labels, right? Oops, a bit of white, line, white wine left over there. Hopefully it's not white lime or white lime. There we go. So we're talking 17, so three years. A tad over three years. All right. So just on the site, you see it's kind of a, a little bit of a dull, but kind of a medium minus red color. I would call this somewhat ruby, but if you look at the edge, you'll see that there's a little bit of oranging, a little bit of browning on it. And that's definitely characteristic of Sangiovese for sure. Now, I didn't get the stats on the percentages and I don't know if it has it on the back, but uh, you know, there's nowhere on the label that lists the grapes, but they listed them in a certain order. Depending on whether that is the official list in order of, of uh, proportion or not, but still Sangiovese can have, you know, very much a color like this. So yeah, let's not dwell on the color too much, but there isn't much staining on the glass. So I would say this is probably a decent amount of Sangiovese and Grenache also. Grenache can also exhibit these types of colors and it can also oxidize fairly quickly like Sangiovese. Let's check it out. So we'll do the fruit first. First kind of like a dried cranberry, dried cherry, um, dried plum, a little bit of raspberry, all this is like drier, dried, not necessarily underripe. And I'm not talking like like dried out, like desic, not necessarily like, like um, not like raisinated, but like drier. Okay, a little desiccated. But fruit isn't what's the main part. I mean, it's there and it's absolutely noticeable. But I really get this earthiness out of it. A little raspberry too. Just I don't think I said that already. But there's like an earthiness. There's a leather felt dust. So. Typical San, uh, typical Sangiovese, honestly, typical Italian wine for me. There's a little bit, you know, animal, a little leather, like I already said, a little dried earth, a touch of dried mushroom. It, it's like you really just, you really like put some, some uh, drier but ripe fruit and you kind of just mash it into, into like, into the dirt, threw a little bit of leaves on there and uh, maybe you found your, maybe your leather wallet was there, kind of in the mix, right? That's what it smells like. So I'm, I'm totally down with that. It's one, it's one of the reasons why I love Italian wine. I don't drink enough of it, but I'm a big fan of Italian wine. Let's check it out. Let's taste this thing. Palate confirms the nose. It's almost exactly verbatim what I just said, but we're barely repeating. The fruit's, a, a, the fruit's still tart. The fruit is still on the drier side. It's a little fresher than being dried. So I taste the, the actual flavors of the fruit. So the raspberry, the cranberry, the cherry, cherry, and this is all tart, all sour in nature. Even a little bit of strawberry in there, almost like a dried strawberry. There's also a bit of like mint to this, which is not unusual because you have the Bordeaux varieties in there 
and they can exhibit some type of mint quality. But it's like a spearmint, a little bit, but it's really faint, but I kind of notice it at first and that's kind of fading out a little bit. I really get like the dirt, like little twigs and leaves and forest floor, that kind of stuff. The, well, the nose I get the mushroom, let's put the palate again. A little bit of forest floor. When I'm doing the retronasal, breathing out through my nose while I had the wine in my mouth, there was a touch of volatile acidity, which is absolutely normal for Italian wine. It's just a touch of it. It's not like super, super high, but there's a little bit of that volatile acidity. Even though it's only three-ish years old, it feels like there's a little bit of oxidation going on. So you're getting that leather quality. You're getting that kind of, not a coffee, but you're getting like a, a little bit of oxidized, not quite, I wouldn't necessarily say nuttiness, but like an aged leather type of thing. Under 20 bucks, man. Actually, I paid less than 15 for it. It's a fantastic wine. I'll say this, you know, the first part, the middle part of, the, of this whole show that I've done, you know, all this channel I've done, this, this, this thing I've done, I got really spoiled working at Morton Steakhouse, working in fine dining and really having a lot of access to a bunch of really expensive wine. And by really expensive, I mean 30, 40, 50 bucks and higher on the retail side and double-ish that when you go to restaurants. And this last couple of years, I've really, I would say been humbled because I've been revisiting a lot of these wines that are under that and usually 20 bucks-ish or less. And I've been really surprised and really, really pleased with, not surprised, more pleased with these wines. And I haven't reviewed a lot of them. I've been drinking them. And this is one of those wines where, you know, I saw it and I was like, let's check it out. You know, I don't know much about it. I needed an Italian wine for the house and I might as well review it. This one is fantastic. Like, I mean, for being a $15-ish bottle of wine, a Super Tuscan, you know, Super Tuscan doesn't have to be expensive. That's we associate super Tuscan wines with that, but super Tuscan is really just a generic term that just means it doesn't fit in any of these sub appellations of Tuscany. It fits the IGT of Tuscany, which means almost anything goes. So it just needs to have, I think, I think an IGT has to have a little bit of Sangiovese in there. I'll look that up and put it in, in the video here somewhere. But yeah, I mean, you're combining Sangiovese with usually Bordeaux grapes or fr French grapes in general. So Bordeaux or Syrah grapes, like these guys did. It's really delicious wine. It's appropriately priced. It's, it's in the, it's, it's where it needs to be. It's not, you know, it's not, it's just, we're not talking $200 bottle of wine. It's not saying it compares to Sasakai or something like that for like 400 bucks. But I mean, for a, an everyday drinking wine, <laughs> yeah. All right, so that's today's show, man. Again, if you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and tell all your friends. Until next time, we'll see you later.